I'm a PM on PowerShell team. And I'm Mark Gray, another PM on the PowerShell team. We both work on DSC. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about all up what we have done new in version 5 of TSC. So it's not like what's new now, but across the last eight, nine months, whatever is done. So a lot of things might be repeat and we might, we'll try to go as fast as we can, but try to cover all the new functionality that's been added in DSC. All right. So we'll start. I'm not going to talk about that one because I'm sure all of you have seen that one. We're all about, from a DSC and PowerShell perspective, simplicity, velocity, and ubiquity. Um, real quickly, from a DSC perspective, um, simplicity, I think that's kind of the underlying definition of DSC. I mean, simple, simple, simple. All it is is properties and values, and anybody can look at it and know what it's going to do. Um, that's kind of the, the base of DSC. Um, and configuration drift, you apply it, and it's not going to drift away from that. You can make it keep applying and, and stay in the state that you want it to be in. Um, velocity, um, you know, code reuse, sharing, community, we've talked about all of those things so far, but um, that's a big thing in DSC. And ubiquity, we've kind of touched on this a few times, but um, the whole, from the beginning, DSC has been um, designed in such a way that it can be used to configure everything in the data center. We started on Windows because we own Windows, but we the whole goal has been to do it in a standards-based way. So it can be ported to Linux, it can be ported to top of rack switches and stuff like that. And um, we have a little bit of that here and there. We have a DSC client, or I'm sorry, a DSC client on Linux right now. It can do some things. It can talk to the full server and stuff like that. Um, but it will grow and grow as we as we move forward. Um, Simplifies configuration, drift, flexible deployments, um, continuous deployment. We haven't really talked too much about that, but DSC has um, allows you to do continuous deployment. So you can have a single configuration and apply that to your development environment. And in that scenario, potentially you have um, IIS, the example I always use, you have IIS and SQL installed in the same box with this configuration. When you go to test, you want IIS on one machine, you want SQL on another machine. When you go to production, you want four IIS servers and one SQL server in the back end. You can do all of that with DSC without changing the configuration itself, just by passing different information into that configuration. So we give you the flexibility to do that as well. Um, and the different components of desired state configuration. Um, the configuration, the resources. Um, resources are the smart stuff. I do the configuration. The configuration is the intent. And then the engine does all the magic there that you don't have to worry about in DSC, like the error checking and logging and all of that kind of stuff that muddies up scripts when you have to put that stuff in there. Um, oops. Um, that's the make it so. The, what I was talking about with the DevOps is the what and the where. Um, <coughs> when you define in DSC what the structure should look like, you can pass environmental data into that and have it come out and be different for different environments. So if you have a different um, home drive that you're going to use in production than you are in test, you can pass that information in without changing the configuration itself. What else? That's it. And then not the yeah. payment. So uh, when we looked at the things uh, that have been done in version 5, there are essentially two categories. You can uh, bucket them. One is as a DSC resource author, what do I do? What, what is the additional stuff for me? And the other one is as a configuration author, what are the benefits I get with using the new version of PowerShell? So we'll talk about the resource author first. So if you look at resource authors in traditional in version four, they have to create a mock based resources. And if you look at mock based resources, you have a folder and that contains a file name, it becomes a module, that's the simple stuff. Then you have to create a subfolder and then another folder and put all your mock stuff there. So all this stuff happens and there's structure that needs to be followed and we made it easier by having a resource designer. So you can download the resource designer and you say, I want a new resource with this property under this module, it'll do the magic for you. But it's still a lot of work and you have to keep things in sync. And that's where the class-based resources comes handy is when you start using them, you have a simple folder with a manifest file, it becomes a, a module manifest becomes a module and then you have resource.psm1, another one simpler it's not and if people who want to do math here is the math 
<laughs> for mock based resources, for n resources, you end up having 3n plus 3 files and folders combined. For a class based resources, you so it's order n. So if you have 10 resources, you are about 10 ish file. In the mock based world, you are in around 30 file. So that's another way to convince you guys to start looking at class based resources. And here is third attempt to explain you this is mock based resource structure. That's class based resource structure. Okay, questions? Looks good so far. Good. You can. I was just going to say the um, one thing to keep in mind is that if you're using WMF4 or down level systems that don't have WMF5 on it, the MOP is what you're stuck with. Right. Classes are only supported in the WMF5. So classes are supported in version 5 onward so it will not be ported down to WMF4 but WMF5 goes all the way to the same set of system that WMF4 uh, goes to. So if you, there is a specific scenario like oh I want to write a resource but they are not going to use WMF5 and they are using on WMF4 then yeah either you have to write two one MOF one class or just write MOF and then because we are going to support MOF we are not saying rewrite everything from MOF to classes. But encouragement is do classes, it's easy to add features there. We might run in scenarios where we'll say, oh, we will add feature, but only in the classes, but not in the MOF, because it doesn't work, or it's extra effort, or. So the directional push is class-based resources, but necessity is both MOF. Would it be possible to make the new resources depend on a upgrade PowerShell step before, and still uh, have it deployed on a uh, the MIF4 version that upgrade itself? So, you so you, yes, you can upgrade your WMF4 to WMF5. In, this, in the same... Uh, configuration? Yeah. Um, in the same configuration, yes, you can use a package resource to install WMF5. So you can use DSC to update DSC, which requires a reboot. Uh, but I... I'm not sure if you can do everything in a single configuration because when you try to parse it, it'll say, yeah. hey, I don't understand it. Yeah, so exactly. that's where you can potentially use partial configurations yeah. to say, I'll do first step first and then the second one, and we'll talk about partial configurations. So just a quick demo of what it looks like. So here is a class-based resource. And if you do control J um, in, you will find a snippet for class-based resources as well. So that was added, snippets uh, for class-based yeah. resources, which explains how to write them. Uh, here is a simple service resource. It has a string property. So keywords are DSC resource. On top of a class, it makes a DSC resource. DSC property, whether it's type key, or empty means optional, and not configurable means you don't use it when you are using them in configuration, but they are returned when you call the get DSC configuration. So here's a name, state, startup type, display name, ensure, and process ID. So those are the properties of the resource, and then you have three methods. Get set and test, same logic. Test ret requires a Boolean value to be returned. The get has to return the same type. So it's called X service class. You're returning an instance of that class, and the set doesn't re return anything. And once you write it, uh, you from a configuration perspective, it's no different. You still say import DSC resource, the name of the module, adds a configuration author. You don't know whether it's class based or MOF based. It doesn't make any difference. You compile, you get the same MOF, you apply, engine takes care of it. But as a resource author, you get value by writing in a single file. You don't have to learn MOF in PowerShell. You have to just remember your PowerShell. Questions? Yeah, we, we used to have uh, like, uh Types we, we were not allowed to do because of the, the MOF compatibility, like hash table, right? Is that being dealt now with class uh, uh, on, on, on compilation so, side? Uh, under the covers, class creates MOF. DSC engine still understands MOF. So uh, there are some limitations in MOF that are still there. Uh, we have to work those around. Now, given that we are not asking people to write MOF, we have more flexibility. There are places where we are already looking at one of those things are if a property is a key, it cannot take a collection. It can take only one value. That's a limitation somewhere in the system. I don't know where, but we want to fix it. Nobody likes it. We said, 
whatever yes the standard and something but given now we are not showing you more we can do anything un under the covers so hash table mm -hmm. is yes it will be translated to shimmins right yeah collection can you go up to the top and show the beginning of that class i'm sorry and you said that um there's a snippet for dsc yes so there is a snippet um control j there's dsc resource with class class thank you and it has everything and um given it's class-based resource uh, if you make mistakes it tries to warn you during the compilation time here itself and say oh sorry let me just pull it up uh, if you don't type it correctly it'll say oh cannot find this type and if you put <coughs> bogus one which is a valid type say ps credential uh, then it squiggles and says hey invalid get method it must return the same type an exceptional parameter so all those things you get early binding and in the same file. That was the one part of class-based resource. Uh, the other new addition which was recent in April WMF was PSDSC run as credential. So typically every time you run a DSC resource, it runs under system context. You have to have a credential parameter if you want to do something in a different user context. And that was a pain. A lot of scenarios people tried and they ran into Lego. Right? It doesn't work in installing Visual Studio doesn't work if you try to use local system context. It requires your user profile for some reason. Uh, so we added that one. So there is a built-in free common optional parameter called PSTAC run as credential. Um, that was in April WF5. In the production preview, you now have additional variable called PSTSC context. As a resource author, now you can actually get the run as user under which you are going to run that resource and you can do things. There are places where you'll say, hey, if the run as user doesn't belong to administrative group, it's an error. So you can find those things early rather than let the code fail. That's what we have done. So, so and to be clear, the PSDSC run as is not anything you need to add to your resource. If yes. you it's on all resources by default. So if you write a resource and someone wants to run your resource as another account, they can do it. It's just part of the system. We launch that resource as that context and it'll just be <coughs> another. Question. Is, is that only ever going to be a WMF5 feature? Because I have real issues with WMF4 with Cred SSP and you know, my yes. credentials have got to come back in and then I'm subjected to. Yes, it's, it's going to stay a WMF5 feature. Uh, there will. There are a couple of things we are thinking of adding more here, and they might even become very restrictive to only class-based resource. So right now it's available for both mock-based resource, class-based resource. During when we call your get, set, and test method, we just uh, call them in that user context. Um, right now, the code that we checked in didn't made it into the production preview, but the next release, whenever, whatever that is, You'll have PSDC run as credential works correctly with class-based resources. There is some known issues that when you try to do it, it doesn't work. Either it doesn't work completely or... Uh, and then uh, the PSDSC context, that will be also available in class-based resources. So there are thoughts of uh, allowing people to say, hey, I don't want this property to be just optional. I want it to be mandatory for my resource. Or my resource never will work with the user context so I don't want that property to be shown at all so we have thoughts we have some designs there but that's future looking at this point point. and <coughs> quick demo this is the dirty demo because it uses a script resource and it uses PSDSC allow plain text password don't do, do that <laughs> <laughs> disclaimer so I've just commented it out and the only thing I'm doing is I'm just telling you under what context I'm running um, if I go here and say cd run as, run as ps.1, it's going to compile and run it for you. And you will see it says you're running as anti-authority system. That's the default one. Now you go back and say, hey, I want to run in a different user context. Save it. Run again. Ask for password. I'm giving it for the administrator. It goes and runs and it tells you you are running as the local administrator. That's quick and dirty, shows the value. Um, and now when you try to see what's the use case, I have a real use case which I'm going to put on GitHub soon. This is setting up your internal PowerShell gallery. 
which I didn't get to demo before. I'm not going to run <laughs> it. Uh, but when you are doing a PowerShell gallery, you turn on a couple of IS related features. There's some SQL Express is the backend we are using from a demo purpose. You can change it to full SQL. You create a local, um, local user, which will be the, your gallery admin. And then when you start looking at things, hey, I want to create a SQL Express instance, but I want that instance to be in a specific user context, which is the gallery admin context. You get it for free. You don't have to write code around it. So that's one. The other one is once I have the instance, I want to create a database. Again, I want to create a database in that user context. You get it for free. Third one is I want to create some tables which are new get specific or gallery specific on that thing. Again, you get it for free. So that was like, oh, I enable this feature. I can use it here very fast. Question. Uh, which um, X drives do this user need? What access right does this user need? Mm -hmm. Clarify more. Uh, in like this run scenario, as user? Uh, run as user could be anything, whatever you want. Okay, but so, don't need specific rights on box? No, there okay. should be a valid user on that box. And then if they're not admin, they cannot do things that admin requires to do. Okay. Or if they're admin, then so there's no, as long as a valid user account is fine. They just need permission to do whatever the script, the underlying script is going to do, the resource script. Okay. Um, so actually one other thing on there at the, not on the demos, but the um, PSDSC run as works for script resources. Right. It does not work for native resources and currently there's only one native resource, which is the file resource. So in a file resource, if you try to use it, <coughs> it looks like it's working, it's not working. <laughs> that's that's for the first time and we said somebody oh yeah it works for me see i've written a file resolve like no it's not hooked in there all right um so one other thing that we've added that um if steve was in here he would be all excited about is the ability to um, make use of dsc resources so um with dsc being a platform, we want to enable the management of Windows, and we want to do it through DSC, but we also want other solutions to be able to use it as well. Um, so Chef and Puppet both are taking advantage of this Invoke DSC resource, where they want they have their own system, their own structure of running and things like that, but managing Windows is a pain in the butt, as the whole reason for DSC. Um, it's not just text configuration, their APIs and all that kind of stuff. So we have this um, big community and a plethora of DSC resources. We want them to be able to take advantage of it. So this Invoke DSC resource allows them and you to actually call the individual methods on a resource. So you can use it if you're developing a resource. You can test it by actually doing the Invoke DSC resource call the method on it and see what comes back instead of doing what I've had to do before this, where you import module for the resource and then you call the test DSC resource or test local, re what is it? Test oh, target, target, resource. target resource and things like that. So it allows you to call the individual methods. The other thing that it does, I think Puppet, when they run, they do a get, so they check the state of the system right now and then they do a test and set and another get. It allows them to go through their own workflow of However they want to call the resource, whatever methods they want to call, they can do on that as well. And you could do that as well if you write your own client. Um, one of the caveats to that is it runs locally only. The intent with this was for it to work with the puppets and chefs and stuff like that out there. So you can't remote in and do this. You have to do it locally. And uh, one other difference of what Mark said is in previously whenever we used to debug ourselves, I was like, oh, I'm going to import a module called get set and test methods. You're running in your user context. But when system runs, it runs in the local system context. So with invoke DSC resource, you can test those individual methods very easily because they will be running in the local yeah. system context. And it also abstracts out. So we're calling through the LCM engine. It's not doing um, any of the overhead that you do if you pass in a full script, like making sure there are no conflicts or anything like that. You're calling through the engine, and it abstracts away whether it's a script resource or a native resource or a class resource or whatever. It's just these are the methods that are available to you, and you can call them. Um, go ahead. Right, local only? Um, <laughs> because we were doing it for third parties so that they okay. can access the resources. Um, it also prevent me from having an automation server. So 
fine self service portal okay. and we didn't do to it to prevent and that but there i think there were um, security concerns about allowing you to do that remotely as well because okay. it is going to be running as a local system and all that kind of stuff so um, the other thing when we first implemented this in the meta config you had to set the refresh mode to disabled for this to even light up we've actually since reversed that um, so you don't have to change the engine at all you can just call the methods um, so it allows you to do that the disabled is still there so in the scenario where you want to put the machine into maintenance mode you can set the refresh mode to disabled and it's just going to stop running um, so there is a use case for that um, so that's still there um, all right so debugging um, we talked about this in the devops um, session that we did. Um, one of the things that I don't think I did talk about was disable debug. Um, you can enable debug for DSC and what that does is put the system into debug mode so when it goes to run a DSC configuration it'll stop at the first resource and wait for you to connect to it. Um, to get out of that mode you hit disable. So if you do enable the system will stay that way every time it tries to run it's going to stop and wait for you to connect. And we have a bug in the slide it's enable DSC debug and disable DSC debug. Yeah. Yeah. That will be too genuine. File a GitHub issue. <laughs> um, well, this is pretty important, right? Because now we do not have to generate a meta map anymore to yeah. enable this. Exactly. And that was the reason when we started, we, we put it there and it was like, oh, for debugging, you have to change the state of the system. And after that, you, and that's not the normal debugging pattern. So we pulled it out. Uh, we we didn't get enough time to light up it completely so today you have to say enable dsc debug dash break all it's a parameter which is mandatory and we ask you to type it the idea is in future we will make it optional but we put it out there and today um, another limitation in the complete experience that we want is it will break at every resource so you cannot specify i want to debug this specific resource in my configuration the tenth resource uh, it will go through each one of them. You have to hit F5, F5 a couple of times and then reach the right one. Uh, that we know and we want to clean up all those stuff, but too many things. Um, and we also talked about in the other session the um, enter PS host process and debug run space. Um, those, again, are used by the DSC resource to debug those things. Um, the other thing that was added when the underlying was the get run space, so you can actually see the run spaces are, that are in a process. Pester, in the DevOps session, I didn't get to talk too much about this because we ran out of time. Um, it's not specifically new to DSC, um, but it is very valuable from a DSC perspective, so we wanted to make sure we injected it in here. Um, it allows you to do unit testing, so I think the description of Pester is it um, specifically lights up unit testing and I think a lot of people um, especially for the custom resources use um, pester for the unit testing of those resources it's also valuable for unit testing your configurations themselves and I have an example of that that I'll show but it also as Steven showed is good for unit or integrate integration testing um, so you can actually stand up a VM run that VM and make sure that it was configured the way that you want it to be configured um, yes. Are you working with Pester to, to highlight Pester functionality for classes as well? Because that, that's a bit difficult right now. You have to write a function around it, which instantiate a class, and then, well, do iteration on the object. Hmm. And, and, well, in, in the, in the in light of the DSU resource, it would be nice to, well, do it like as, as a script module. Hmm. So, so right? is the limitation because uh, the classes don't export the types? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. No. So we, we are contributing to Pester and uh, classes is important with, even without DSC. So if it's not working correctly now, we'll, we'll fix it. Okay. We, oh. we, internally, we have a, a, adopted Pester as our testing framework. Uh, we had, I don't know how many thousands of test, uh, test, uh, test cases before in our internal testing framework and we are changing them. So it's just a matter of time where we say, okay, yes. Uh, so you will hit that yourself? Yeah. Even if you don't hit it, we, before hitting, we'll know that, yes, from a complete scenario of classes, I can write them, I can use them, I can debug them, and then, okay, if I cannot debug them completely, 
and I can test them. So both the debugging work and the pesto testing work will, will work. Yeah. So along those lines, we're so invested in it that it's actually part of Windows and part of WMF5, so it actually shifts with it. No, it's there. It's not part of WMF5. It's not part of WMF5 is what I meant to say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and um, the reason we, we had a debate on that, why we don't put it on WMF5 is WMF5 goes on down-level systems, and down-level systems might already have PEST and PS3 lines. So we, and it takes, it makes life difficult when you upgrade and service and patch. So we said, okay, let's wait for it. People have been using those anyway, so. All right, um, so let me jump into a demo here real quick on Pester. Um, so how many of you are familiar with Pester or have used Pester? So just half or so of you. All right, um, so I, I will kind of go over here real quickly because we don't have a ton of time, but we do have time for it. So I have a configuration here. It's a basic configuration. If you guys have seen our demos in the past, you've seen this configuration. It's the Fourth Coffee website. Configuration. It's a simple configuration that stands up a ASP website. That the website actually doesn't work in this case, but um, it's a configuration. Very simple. A few different things. Um, in order to do some testing on this, um, you create a single file. That's um, typically the name of the configuration. Test. Ps1. Um, and in there you have the pester syntax, um, you have the describe statement, which basically groups a bunch of tests together. In this case, I want to test the website, and then you give it a context, or you can have a context below that, which can group additional tests underneath it. And in this case, I'm doing a bunch of tests on the script itself, and then I want to do some tests on the node configuration that's generated by the script. Um, so inside of those, you do the tests themselves, so they all start with it, and then you give it a description, and then you have the test, and the tests in these cases are, I want to make sure that the, um, the configuration is a script, I guess, in this type right. case. So I'm checking and doing a get command on it, making sure that it's actually a configuration script and it's not a PS or a regular script. Um, you can check whether, you make sure that it's not a meta configuration. So the keywords that you have here to help you out are should, should not, all of these things can be knotted. So these can be strings or true values or whatever. This is a simple comparison. Um, we have the, I guess that just should be as well. So I'm checking a bunch of things. You want to make sure that it throws. You know that this is an invalid um, path, so it will fail. So you can check to make sure that something throws when it runs. Um, you can check to make sure that it takes three parameters. So you can check the parameters. What the heck? Um, you can check the parameters on the script itself, so that they should be null or empty, or should not be null or empty. So you can do that comparison, and then you can check that it matches, so make sure that it actually has this string within um, the, the this definition itself. Um, and then for the node configuration itself, I do a bunch of things, making sure that a single file gets generated when you call it, so I'm going to do a run the configuration itself, output it to a folder, and make sure that only one moth gets created underneath there. Um, so you can do those kinds of comparisons. You can make sure that the file with that name is created, so you can make sure that that file exists in there. Um, what else? You can make sure that it's a valid moth. Um, this comment down here is potentially a better way to do it, um, but I have not gotten that to work yet. All can this I does. Can I just <laughs> How quick are you? Um, so there is a public class in our internal names. Yeah. Ah. So I, I will try to get this to work before I put it out on GitHub. But um, this all this does is make sure that it's a MOF, not that it's a valid DSC MOF. And this code down here is supposed to make sure that it's a valid DSC MOF. Um, and then we check to make sure that the version is correct. So if you're expecting a version 2.0 of the document, you can check that. Um, and lastly, you want to check to make sure, so I did called the configuration with a different name and made sure that I got a, that name of the moth to generate there as well. Um, and this is kind of cool. There's a before each and after each. So when each of these things run, it generates a um, configuration moth, as you guys know. And you can take advantage of, I think I use it in here. When I output it, I output it to a test drive. Can I not do that in here? 
top. Okay. Yeah, so the output path is a test drive. So when these tests run, they generate a, a, a temporary directory, or a PS drive, that you can use to actually dump your stuff to so you're not mudd muddying up your system. So you can use that test drive. And then before each of these, you can wipe it out to make sure that you have a fresh system when you're actually running them. So you get some cool stuff that you can do there. Um, so the tests that I run, and I'm actually not going to run this in time, but you can run uh, invoke uh, against a specific um, test. So you can say, I want to run that test and get the um, information back. You can run it against all tests. So the way that it works is when you run in, um, Pester by default, it's going to look for any file named .test.ps1 and try to run that and give you the results from that back as well. Actually, I'm going to run this one real quick and see if it explodes on me. Um, just so you can see the kind of output that this gives here. Um, so if I run that, it's going to run just that test I was talking about and come back and tell you each of the tests that were run, whether they passed or failed. Um, and this syntax is really messed up. Every time I read this, I'm like, what, 10 failed? But it's actually passed colon 10, failed colon 1. So, um, so that gives you that information. I did expect that to fail, so it was not a surprise to me. Um, but one of the other really cool things you can do here is. That thing you should add uh, shoots pro, right? Yeah. <laughs> it is just shoots pro, isn't it? It was. Yeah. 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 It's wrapped in the curly braces and then it Um. So if I run this one, it'll run the same test and give me the code coverage. So it'll look at the actual implementation and see how much code I'm actually hitting with my test, which can be really powerful as well. I thought that was awesome. So you can actually, when you do your um, information there. So the last one is just running a test against everything. Um, and then this output here is actually pretty cool as well. If you use Team City or anything like that, you can run these tests output them to a format that Team City and stuff can understand and those CI systems can read that information and decide whether the test passed or not. Um, so it gives you some cool flexibility there. Questions? No, it's just uh, it's oh, okay. cool. All right, um, and I just have a sample here that I was starting to outline. Instead of using a CI system, um, you could actually use PowerShell to do some logic to say, I'm going to run these tests and I'm going to run my static analysis first and if that passes I'm going to run my unit tests, if those pass I'm going to run my integration tests, so it's, it allows you to do a lot of that cool stuff with these things. So. Questions, comments, no? Alright. ISE enhancements. So now let's move on to as a configuration author what benefits do I get when I start using PowerShell 5? And this one we already showed, so this is just a list of things. There's IntelliSense improvements, and I called it out, yes, you have to use Control plus spacebar. Not everybody knows about it. You can list properties and types, and if what are their valid values, if you do it after the resource name or inside the res uh, resource block. Um, and if a resource has validate set, you can go and say after equals to tap, 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 or Control spacebar, it'll show you the list, so you can do that. And on depends on, you can also do tap, 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 it circle through, or you say control space, but it lists all the things you can depend on before or after, doesn't matter. So that's one set of things, and then there are more snippets. So these are the three specific uh, snippets we added, which is uh, how to write a configuration with configuration data. Assume you have a configuration data, what is the syntax looks like? Um, how to create a configuration data? It's hash table containing a all nodes, which is a collection of hash tables. It kind of gets difficult. And the last one was uh, DSC resources using classes. So all those three were the new addition in uh, production preview. So just wanted to list that out. And meta configuration. So I touched on this in the, my pull server um, session real quickly, but I knew I was going to talk about it here, so I waited to kind of dig into it here. But there's we basically um, in V1 the meta configuration was a local configuration resource inside of a regular configuration. We have kind of pulled that out now, so there's a configuration that will run on the target node, and then there's a configuration specifically for meta configuration. Um, and you define that by saying this is a configuration, you have an attribute on the top, which I'll show you, that's just a DSC local configuration manager. And then it does a lot of cool things. It, it basically shows you what resources are available in that configuration, so um, you can actually see, you won't see all of the other um, configurations, or I'm sorry, resources. 
like the uh, built-in resources and custom resources, you'll only see the resources that are available in for meta configuration. Um, the local configuration manager resource has been replaced by settings, so it's um, all of the generic settings for the LCM that are in there. And then you have three types of resources that are in there. You actually have another one that I didn't, didn't list here, but you have configuration repository web, which says this is where you go to get the configurations. You have the resource repository web, which says this is where you go to get the resources, and then you have the reporting server web. Um, you actually have another one that's a configuration repository SMB or share or something like that, um, where if you use the file server, you can say go get the configurations from that file share. And I think you have the same one for resources repository share. Yeah. Um, so I will jump over here real quick and show you the new meta configuration. So this is the configuration for the target nodes in the pull server session that I had. Um, in here, you have the settings <coughs> node, and actually if I come up here and hit control spacebar, you can see a list of configuration types or resources that you can use for meta configuration. So you have all the ones that we listed there, partial configurations and stuff like that. Um, if you come into the settings node and control space on that, you can see all the properties that are available on that. In the V1, it was basically, I think, at the LCM level you could see, but when you got into the individual resource managers themselves, it was a hash table that you had to put in there and you had no guidance on what that was. With these rich types now, you click on that and you see what the required properties are, what the optional properties and all that are, so you really get a lot more information on what you can actually do in the meta configuration now. Um, so, and you can have multiple of these things, so if I have multiple pull servers I want to connect to, you can define multiple, multiple of them there, point them to different pull servers and stuff like that. The way that the pull server configuration will work, so depending on the resource, it will behave differently. You can only have one report server right now. You can have multiple configuration servers and multiple repository servers. Um, the way that the configurations work is it's going to go to each one and say, do you have configurations for me? If it does, it'll pull them down and apply them. The resource configuration will basically I think there's a depends there, where, uh, no, there's not. Um, so, it, with the resources, um, it will basically, if it finds a resource on that um, server, it'll pull that down and it won't go to the other ones. Um, because you have the version that you needed and it will quit at that point. Um, so, any questions about the meta configuration? You can have node statements in here, so if you have a meta configuration that's different per node, you can define those there as well. Question. Well, uh, one question is actually related to a comment you made in the last session, and that was uh, that this was never designed to be enter for the enterprise, but it seems like there's a lot of scaling out here that would imply that you're going for um, the I don't know if you can elaborate on that statement. So I Someone else asked me about that afterwards as well. The, the comment there was the, the pull server that we created, the implementation that we did was not, um, we didn't do it as a solution per se that would have a UI and have be scalable and all that kind of stuff. It was a, a proof of concept, if you will, for the protocol. So the whole system has been designed so it's enterprise ready and can scale and all that kind of stuff but our implementation of the pull server that we ship in box is kind of a starting point sure but so okay so that was the original intent but now because it seems like so meant, okay. yeah so right now with with azure automation which is building on top of the same protocol that pull client uses to talk to our pull server the inbox pull server uh, that's where we are making it more scalable more enterprise ready and if and when we go and open source the full server code, then there will be places where people say, okay, I need to put a hook to replace the inbox SQL database and use the actual real SQL server. So it's possible, it's just... No, yeah, no, it's just, sorry, I just had yeah. thought popped okay. up again. No, it's I had a, that conversation a, at lunch too, so I thought... It's a good time. question, because it did come but, up. If and when you open source it, do you govern it like the resources? Will you, will you stay authoritative for the, for the pool server? Like uh, the intent is to do it. We don't want to just go, here it is, do what you want with it. We want it to be a structured project where people 
uh, um, contribute to it, we contribute to it, and it comes with a solution that will work for a lot of people. Awesome. And like in the previous demo, uh, previous session when uh, Mark wrote all this UI, nice UI, to talk to, he'll open source it and we'll make sure it looks nice and shiny. <laughs> <laughs> all right, partial configs. Okay, so, um, so partial config, is a new thing in version five. In version four, you can only de deliver one document to the system and that has to have everything. With partial config, now you have the option to say, I will give you fragments. In the end, all those gets merged, validation happens on them, you cannot have duplicates and stuff. Uh, to still have a single document to represent the final state of the system, but when people started using DSC in ver uh, version four of PowerShell, they said, oh, I own the machine, I can install patches and stuff, but I'm not the SQL admin on the box. And for me to sit with the SQL admin and make sure we do it right, first time is okay, but next time if he has to make change, he has to make sure we have to sit together so he's not making changes to my portions of the thing. And that's where we, we realize that there's a, a need for partial configuration so people can own different pieces of the machine they want to configure but at the same time, it's not free for all. I'll do whatever I want to do and you do whatever you want to do. It's still merge. So there are a um, couple of concepts there that you can have a dependency between the fragments. So when using partial configuration, first you have to tell the machine, hey, you, I'm configuring you for partial configuration. These are the named configuration you would expect. And then you can say they should come in this order. Uh, one additional thing is there, you can take specific ownership in a partial configuration to say, this partial configuration will exclusively use firewall resource. Nobody else will use firewall resource. That's, it's, it's a coordination boundary, it's not a security boundary. Anybody who has admin right can go and change those settings. So we were very clear, we are not going to design a security system at this point. We are going to do a coordination boundary. So people will coordinate, think about it upfront. Hey, this is how we are going to configure our machines and you own this piece of configuration and you own that piece of configuration and it'll reach the box and it merge. And for that, there was additional concept added called uh, published DSC configuration. So you just push the configuration, it doesn't get invoked. You are just deploying it on the machine and then you can use start DSC configuration, use existing to force that invocation or whenever the consistent cycle happens, it'll merge all the partial configurations and apply. Under the covers, all those partial fragments that you're delivering to the system they are stored separately, so you can update one independent of another, but during runtime it gets merged and validated and once it becomes a single pending dot .mof or current dot .mof. Question? Also, test that with testing it, like you have to multiple, the partial configurations, bind them together and then put them through to test it. So, if somebody changes like a partial configuration, right. and you uh, bound it together, so your question is, if uh, there are partial, multiple partial configuration, when you do a test DSC configuration, do we merge? So today, DSC, uh, test DSC configuration just works against the configuration that is already on the system, which is either in the pending state or the current state. Uh, there is the new functionality uh, we have added, but that also takes a single configuration document. So test will say, given whatever configuration is there or whatever you're providing me, what the state the system is. There's no separate thing about... From a tester perspective, I think the way that you would go about that is an integration test where you stand up a VM, apply the configuration, and make sure that it ends up... Um, that it's a, there's a single configuration and it has the stuff that you expect in it, and the end, of the end state of the system is the way that you want it to be. Okay. And then you can move on. From there. And uh, the demo of uh, partial configuration is actually what it can do. So. As Mark already told about, um, it is only available in version five with the new uh, syntax for meta configurations. If you use the older one, you can still use it. We don't recommend it. You will not get partial configuration. We are not going to add it there. We want people to move away. So here you have partial configurations. You can say, hey, I have OS layer and a website. And if you go here, it will tell you, you have a configuration uh, source. That's the pull server location. So if you have multiple partial configuration, you can go to different pull servers. Depends on if you want to have dependency across, what is the description of that configuration and exclusive resource. We have even added the notion of refresh mode. So you can say this partial configuration will come through push scenario or other one through pull. Um, 
those are the couple of things. So here is an example where you're saying I have, there's an OS layer configuration which will come and its name will be OS layer. The other one will have a name called website and that's one depends on. So even though the website resource can come independent of OS, it will not get run. Or if you try to run it, it will throw an error saying it's trading on an OS layer. And with the exclusive resources, you are simply saying OS layer is the ownership of computer resource which renames the machine, joins it to the domain. A website will not be able to do it and website will own the website resource. So you can do it at the module level by saying module slash star or you can pick a specific resource if you want to. Uh, what about the built-in resources like file? And uh, file is tricky. I have to check because it doesn't have a module qualification when you call get DSC. But for the other ones, you just use PS desired state configuration as a module name because they are in that. Uh, file I have to check. I, I'm not sure if we plumbed it through. But do you really want to take ownership of file resource? <laughs> um, it's, it's fine. It's valid. And here is, here is the OS layer where it says, oh, as an OS layer, I install the features. And uh, in the web, uh, app layer or the website layer, uh, I will have, uh, this is going to barf because the configuration name is wrong. Um, the configuration name has to match whatever you said in meta configuration today. So it has to be website. So that's uh, the high level partial configuration. How many of you have used partial configuration or tried to use partial? And you succeeded? Yeah, I succeeded. Okay. <laughs> no, I was trying to see. I'm not surprised. <laughs> I was well polished, right? So I do have a question about partial configuration. Um, one of the areas I see is whereby you might want to have a constant reapply, refresh of settings in one of the partial configurations but possibly only audit modes or apply once scenarios, but you can only have one local Right, so the mode. question is uh, the configuration mode is not available per partial configuration, it's at the system level or whole machine level, and what if you want to do? So we have heard it about it before as well, there are people who have different opinions saying, uh, why would you ever want to apply once for one partial configuration? You think nobody touches that machine? And for other piece, it's okay to reapply. So that's something I, I want to talk about and see. It's not the first time we are hearing it. Um, maybe it's like 25th, fifth time. And <laughs> there are people who says, yes, we should do it. And then there's opinion which says, no, it doesn't make sense to let you do some portion only once and everything else multiple times and w is it a confidence issue or it's an actual scenario issue? I, I think you could also have an auditing perspective where you have one department who just wants to confirm settings as it were or like I say but, or one but again they're they're saying oh I'll apply I'll, I'll apply the setting once and then nobody's going to touch it and that's a big statement in the DevOps yeah. world <laughs> nobody's going to touch it sometimes on building servers we do at least uh, run once configuration for installing like SQL and stuff, and then you don't need a apply an auto correct for to see that SQL is actually installed. We just check like small. If you, if your if your test is written correctly, then it will never install SQL again. Yeah, but sometimes the test is really expensive to run, so because okay. you have to run the setup.txt with with some evaluation stuff and it generates an XML and that's to my knowledge the only way to actually know okay. exactly what so the I'll, I'll we'll talk about it after the session because I know there are a couple of things more. Um, I'll let you write, read the slides essentially but um, there are cases where you want to use composite results versus partial configurations, what's the difference? We'll not have time to go through all of this. Um, Internode dependency is another set of resources which lets you do orchestration at the runtime, saying I want all the machines to start together and figure out the magic yourself. And so this one is actually interesting. To the test DSC resource, we've added the capability right now for a test DSC resource or test DSC configuration. The configuration has to have been applied. With this functionality, you can basically say, use this MOF and tell me what the state of the system is compared to that. So you don't have to apply it, you just get the state. And you can do it for a single reference um, configuration against a bunch of machines, or you can say a one to one thing there. So you can say, for all of these machines, check. Um, rich reporting, I think we've touched on that. The get DSC configuration status, if you've not played with that, go play with it. It's awesome and gives you a bunch of information. That's about it. That's about it.